What is the meaning of compliance policy requirements? Well, first, it means everything as far as high-level management executives and high-level exams like the CISSP. And second, there is a video on YouTube by the author of the Cybex book uh, that states domain one topics are mostly the same for the 2021 exam, but compliance policy requirements has some additional new material. So I took this to mean that compliance policy requirements is an old exam topic with some new added material that we have to know. I looked at the old 2018 syllabus as well as the new 2021 CISP syllabus just to make sure. And oh look, it's also part of the old 2018 syllabus too. So how come it's considered a new exam topic? The author states on his YouTube video, and I quote, Domain 1 security and risk management remains mostly the same. There's some new material around specific policy requirements, including compliance related requirements. So I checked both the old 8th edition Cybex book and the very new 9th edition book that is supposed to be updated with all the new 2021 exam topics, and this is what I found. In the 8th edition Cybex book, this is what is written about compliance policy requirements. All this stuff. Compliance is the act of conforming to, conforming to or adhering to rules, policies, regulations, standards, or requirements. Compliance is an important concern to security governance. And the passage information on compliance policy requirements ends with something about PCI DSS. Okay, that's the 8th edition. Let's take a look at the new 9th edition. Um, it's pretty much the same text, right? It's the same thing as the 8th edition, except for this additional new paragraph here that talks about compliance enforcement in terms of the role of Chief Information Security Officer or the Chief Security Officer. That's the only update for this new CISP exam topic of compliance policy requirements from what I'm seeing. But I'm here to tell you more. That's why you subscribe to Study Us in Theory, right? Things in the members portal expand on these small paragraphs of information in the books because we basically need it. You can't truly learn everything about compliance policy requirements in just this new single paragraph. You can't learn about it in just three paragraphs or three pages. You just can't. So here is more information to keep in mind about compliance policy requirements. And I'm going to be saying that word a lot, compliance policy requirements, so get ready. Compliance policy requirements isn't just one thing. It's a whole collection of things. It's, it's a whole system of things. The main objective of, of the compliance policy is to make sure everything is being done in the company that follows the best things to do in order to keep things legal, in order to obey the law and the regulation of the land. Compliance policy or any kind of policy starts with senior management, is initiated by senior management. It starts with the present security governance structure of the company. It involves creating all those documents that you have to know about for the CSP exam. Things like standards, procedures, baselines, and policy. Proper templates should be used for these documents so it looks like, you know, official and consistent throughout the organization. You know, like as if you're working for a real company, not some, not some company that's been thrown together in the, you know, back of a rickshaw or something. This just means, you know, you have your company logo, date, and other things that you just have to put on the cover of a document. And, you know, th things that aren't written in, like, crayon or something. Just like, for example, of this would be just like NIST documents. All NIST documents usually follow a similar format with the same writing and description at the beginning. These documents should also be written in, like, a regular, uncomplicated language that's easy to understand. Nothing to, no greedy, no lawyer talk. Okay, compliance policy requirements also involves holding employees, third parties, users, and even customers accountable for their actions or obtaining certain assurances from them that they're going to follow the law. It's about providing training so those internal or external to the company are able to identify and follow everything in those standards, policies, baselines, regulations, and procedures. As with all things, make sure training is documented and updated and conducted through annual meetings, programs, and ad hoc training sessions. Which pretty much means buy lunch for the company and your employees and teach them about compliance. 
they can sit there and stuff their face while you tell them all about following PCI DSS or HIPAA or whatever you need to do. And it would probably also help to have the employee sign to the fact that they have received training and have confirmed that they understood the material. This is just another way of the company covering their A. So if you ever sue them and say, I didn't know about the compliance policy, they can say, uh, yeah, you did. You signed it right here. You did. Compliance policy requirements can even dictate whether you are allowed to decrypt any kind of network traffic, have a firewall, or IDS, or IPS, and which regulations or laws should be followed like PCI DSS, GDPR, or HIPAA. Hopefully, after reading that passage, you know what the answer to this practice question is. One of the most important things about compliance policy requirements is also to make sure they are up to date with the latest rules, laws, and regulations. Stay up to date with the current law of the land. This is why companies will have and delegate this important task to their legal team. This is why they have a company lawyer. It is also important to make sure there are metrics that can be measured for compliance policies in order to measure the effectiveness of the policies. This is to make sure the policies are indeed achieving the desired outcome. It's like everything in the CSP, guys. If you're going to initiate any kind of policy or program, management wants to make sure that they see results. And the only way to measure results is through hard numbers. And hard numbers are brought forth through metrics and KPIs and graphs and, 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 and math and reports and all that stuff that you know CSPs don't really deal with. Mathematics and all that calcul actuarial stuff. Because in the end, that is the primary objective, to make sure what you're doing is working and bringing value. Compliance policy requirements can take care of all of that. And uh, last thing is compliance policies have this much power because if compliance is not met, the organization can suffer not only financial damage, but also profitability, competitive edge, brand awareness, and long-term reputation gains. And look, any program or policy that is properly managed from start to finish will only help that program to be successful and achieve its goal. Remember, just, just writing a policy and having senior management say, do this, that's not a policy management program. Policy management program means you create the policy, you act on it, you measure it, and then you continue or discontinue it, discontinue it or change it as you go along. It's a whole process. It's not just one step. Not only is this a new CSP exam topic, it's also important for your own and every organization. Does this sound, does this sound like the best answer? Does compliance policy requirements seem like the greatest advantage over the other choices? Does it sound like a good utility to use in order to reduce the risk of credit card data theft? Does it seem like it is providing the greatest satisfaction? Will I or you as a CSP sleep better at night knowing that you have compliance policy requirements in place? I don't know about you, but everything I just learned about compliance policy makes me very comfortable thinking that this is the correct answer for this practice question when choosing the best answer. Let's take a look at choice C, firewall, IDS, IPS. These are three network devices that are strong methods to secure a network. These three topics have large sections written about them in your CSP study guides in Domain 4, Network Security, which, by the way, is the largest chapter in all CSP books across the board. And in the real world, you can fill warehouses full of books written about just these three devices. Luckily for me, network security is my profession, so it helps a lot as a CSP instructor explain the concepts found here. Okay, A firewall is a technical preventative control. An IPS is a technical preventative control. It even has the word preventative in it, intrusion prevention system. A firewall and IPS do two things. They either allow traffic or they don't. That's it. There's no middle ground, unless exceptions and whitelists are created. If your IP address is not permitted per a firewall rule, it will be dropped. If an IPS is configured to drop suspicious signatures, malware packets from entering the network, then that's what it will do. It will actively prevent it. A firewall and an IPS are binary devices. They will either allow authorized connections or they will not. Uh, just real quick, what's the difference between a firewall and an IPS? 
a firewall will inspect network traffic and block or accept them based on certain char characteristics like source IP, destination IP, port, service, or type of connection. An IPS uses signatures of the latest malicious threats and blocks them based on those signatures, which is why it is important to update your IPS signatures often and regularly. There are a ton more differences between them, but this is the main, this is the main one. It is best to have a firewall and an IPS for a more solid and secure network. And an IDS is a technical detective control. It even has the word detect in it, as an intrusion detection system. An IDS will not actively prevent, but will log and send off an alert stating that something suspicious has entered the network. All three of these are a powerful combination to reduce the risk of credit card data theft as well as a lot of other types of risks. But they are all technical controls. Thinking like a manager, you know, using just technology like firewalls and IPS or an IDS or even encryption from choice A, thinking like a manager, all these isn't really going to protect your company. I mean, it is and it will do a great job, but it isn't really going to protect your company. You still need policies, you need standards, you need directives from management to make sure the whole organization is taken care of. Not just technical threats, but physical security, administrative considerations, following the law, being compliant, having incident response processes or BCP DRP strategies. You need a choice out of all four of these choices that can be applied throughout the company. It's seeming like choice B squaring up to be the best choice so far. But let's take a look at choice D, PCI DSS, GDPR, and HIPAA. PCI DSS is the security and protection standard that organizations must follow if processing credit card transactions. The GDPR exists to protect the processing of private European uh, Union citizen private data. That didn't sound right. Let me try that again. The GDPR exists to protect the processing of private European Union citizen data. And I also just learned recently that can also apply to those visiting the EU as well. So if I were to visit the European Union, say I landed in Paris and I was using my credit card, I think I'm also protected under GDPR. That's pretty cool. And HIPAA was signed into US law to prevent the disclosure of private medical data of patients. Out of these three choices, the one that pertains most to our question regarding credit card data, reducing the risk of credit card data theft is, of course, PCI DSS. I mean, you know, PCI DSS is specifically meant for handling the security of credit card data. So this is the only choice that matters the most. A close second would be the GDPR if the credit card belongs to a European citizen or someone traveling in the EU. But it doesn't focus solely on credit cards, but private information in general. And HIPAA deals with patient health data and doesn't really have anything to do with credit cards. Out of all these three choices, PCI DSS is the best choice. But since HIPAA and GDPR aren't really related, this whole choice doesn't seem correct. Right, if one of the choices is wrong, the whole, the whole answer is wrong. But, but let's ask ourselves, is PCI DSS the best answer? Does it provide the greatest advantage, utility, and satisfaction? It can. It can. It definitely can. But who decides if a company should be PCI DSS compliant? What kind of program provides a directive to begin using PCI DSS? What kind of policy requirement will make documents, training, and information available to everyone in the organization to be compliant with PCI DSS? Oh, maybe something like compliance policy requirements. <laughs> Look, by now, you know that choice B is the answer. I even explained choice B in a way that it, that it encompasses all the other answers. But just because it encompasses all the answers isn't the only reason that this is the best answer. Here's a fast breakdown. Encryption works to reduce credit card data theft. SSL decryption, not so much. Encryption is not the best answer because it is too narrow in scope. To reduce the risk of credit card data theft, we need a whole organization-wide operation. We not only need encryption, but we also need firewalls and IPS and IDS. 
We also need PC. We also need PCI DSS because it is because of the following PCI DSS that we even have security controls or encryption and firewalls and IPS and IDS in the first place. And even more, you understand what I just said? I said that because of PCI DSS, we're able to have firewalls and IPS and IDS because they want us to protect that information. PCI DSS wants us to have controls in place to protect credit card information. So that's why we have those technical controls. But even more so is because, even more so, choice B is the best and correct answer is because without it, we wouldn't have the policy that states the organization must follow PCI DSS, which in turn allows us to have more technical preventative controls in the form of those network security devices. So for example, the best answer is choice B because leveraging compliance policy requirements allows us to do and provide more support and protection to reduce credit card data theft than any of the other choices by themselves. Right, so with this practice question, three of the choices, A, C, and D, are great things, except for SSL decryption and HIPAA and maybe even GDPR. But out of those three choices, they all work in, in, in unison. It, they could all work in unison to help reduce the risk of credit card data theft. But choice B is what kickstarts it all. Without choice B, you're not going to have choices A, C, and D. And even then, A, C, and D are nothing compared to what choice B can do for your organization, not just reduce credit card data theft, but any other compliance issues that you may have. I guess I could have just made this video like five minutes long with just that explanation. But this video is really just another way for me to explain the new CISP topic of compliance policy requirements and also a little bit about SSL decryption. A high level topic and also a really technical one. With choice B, you are picking the most high level, the most upstream, the choice that gets things done and isn't just one thing. With choice B, it is not only the correct answer, but it is the best correct answer. All right. Thanks for watching.